For centuries, the graveyard at Tynemouth Priory has been haunted. And to this day, people park in a seafront car park on an evening, scouring it on the hill opposite for the phantoms that have been clearly seen. In 1978, a number of photographs were taken showing long white figures ambling between the headstones. But if you look at the wall of Tynemouth's Holy Saviour's Church, you'll see the carved initials MM and a heart. These types of markings can be seen around the world as a symbol of young love. But these particular ones deserve to be looked for as they're the basis of a supposed curse. M.M. was Mary Marshall, better known as Polly to her friends. She lived with her dad, Robert, in a simple house on Cross Street in Tynemouth. And in 1894, the South Staffordshire Regiment was sent up north to be stationed at Tynemouth Barracks. They were getting ready for military action abroad and needed to be brought up to standard. One of these soldiers was a private called Sam Emery, aged only 20, who spotted young Polly and fell very much in love. Anybody living in the northeast knows of a walk called the Broadway or the Boulevard. It's a beautiful walk from Whitley Bay to Tynemouth or vice versa. And this walk leads directly to Holy Saviour's Church. And during the 18 and 1900s, this was the site for an awful lot of billing and cooing. The churchyard found many lovers flirting, kissing and late at night, sex between the tombstones was not unknown. But the most important thing though was to mark your union into the wall surrounding the churchyard. One Tynemouth clergyman wrote in 1826, once you have proclaimed your love by carving the wall of Holy Saviour's Church, to betray that commitment would curse you to hell and the demons shall pursue you and your family for all time. Well, Polly and Sam carved their love into that wall. It's faded now, but you can still clearly see it. It was the first time Polly had been in love. First time she'd made love. And the commitment that she had promised really meant something to her. However, just when the romance was going so well, Sam's regiment was transferred to Strenshaw, near York. Nowadays, with modern transport, it's a workable distance. Yet back then, it might as well have been Australia. Emery was still in love, so continued communicating by letter. But after a few months, he began to feel that her demeanor towards him was changing. Then out of the blue, she received a letter telling her to watch her back, as he may just arrive in Tynemouth when she least expected it. He'd heard a rumor from another soldier who had family in color coats nearby that Polly had another suitor that she seems to have really taken to. This wasn't true. Polly answered that she would be happy to see him whenever he could get up there. However, the hundred miles between them began to drive Emery crazy. He was wallowing in an insane jealousy, and the more he thought about it, the more manic he became. Finally, in July 1894, Emery deserted and headed up to the north. He met with Polly and spent an afternoon with her, burning his uniform in the garden and he was now firmly back in civilian clothes again. What his girlfriend didn't know was that he'd visited a local ironmonger and he'd bought a large clasp knife and had asked the owner, Thomas Moore of Tynemouth, to sharpen it. His crazed jealousy was about to explode in the most vicious of ways. They were seen walking the Broadway arm in arm, laughing and joking until they neared the churchyard of Holy Saviour's when Emery noticed a slight bruise on her neck and an argument began. The vicar, Reverend Charles Nichols, was on his bike returning from a visit and he saw what he thought was a couple of ruffians play fighting in the churchyard. Yet on getting closer, he saw that a larger man was assaulting someone that they had pulled down to the ground. 
The vicar screamed out for others to help on a busy lane afternoon. He threw his bike to the ground and ran towards the victim as the man ran off. Polly had struggled to her feet. She was covered in blood. Her neck had a huge gaping wound that spurted each time the heart beat. She couldn't speak. She merely gurgled and wide-eyed she staggered towards the reverend, her hands badly cut from trying to defend herself as she fell into the clergyman's arms. He dragged her into the church and lay her down on the couch where she bled to death in a matter of minutes. Two men chased Emery, who on a couple of occasions turned to threaten them with a bloody knife. Thomas Warren said, he looked like a crazed animal staring at us like he wanted us dead too. The other man, James Gibson said, I chased him until he reached the sidings near Tynemouth Station and then he gave me the slip. Later that night when Polly's murder was on everyone's lips, Emery just ambled into their local bar, the Crescent, and asked for some paper. He jotted something down, then slid it into an envelope. He downed a glass of stout and then asked the landlady to only read it once he was long gone. This was the only confession he would ever pen. He was walking towards Tynemouth's prison, known at the time as their house of correction, when two police officers pushed him to the ground, removing a super sharpened clasp knife covered with blood from his belt. Pretty soon he was up in court to face his crime, and the confession guaranteed the result, and he was found guilty of murdering Mary Marshall, his beloved Polly. What was most ironic was that Polly had remained completely loyal to her man, and Emery, riddled with guilt, began writing to her father, begging for his forgiveness. Robert Marshall, her broken father, replied to him, You carved your promise to my girl in holy saviors, and you broke it. You took her life, and you have destroyed mine. The curse will drive you to hell where you deserve. On the 11th of November, 1894, Samuel Emery was led by his executioner, James Billington, to the gallows. Billington said he was ready to die. He seemed calm and unafraid. His only hope was to be reunited with a lassie dispatched, though I doubt that she would wish that, as she enjoys the glorious Almighty. The Holy Saviour's Church was home to a glowing white figure for almost three months following his hanging. The locals believed it to be Polly, still in shock at what the man she truly loved had done to her. In 1972, research was carried out to find out whether the Holy Saviour's curse had affected anyone else. Over 30 locals came forward to say that they were no longer with partners, despite carving their names into the wall. They had entire catalogues of misery that they'd experienced, including stillbirth, cot death, cancer, leukemia, early death, divorce, and or no end of horrific accidents. One had fallen from the cliff to his death, another decapitated during a motoring accident. To betray someone who loves you is said to incite karma to work against you. This is nature's curse upon you. In 1962, Ernie Thompson cheated on his wife in Bedlington with a woman called Sue Stevens from Whitley Bay. During the affair, he suffered an accident with a bandsaw that snapped, slicing into his lisk where his torso meets his leg, severing an artery, and he bled to death. Michael O'Donnell discovered his wife was cheating with one of his best friends. Before he could confront them, they were both killed in a motorway crash head-on on the outskirts of Gateshead. A professional medium, Arthur Conway, stood up at a meeting near Archbold Terrace in Newcastle and said the dead will curse those who betray true love. Those who no longer enjoy the magic of life's energy long to feel that again and will do anything to help them feel. They prey on those who betray the true love of a partner. They seek them out and watch from the shadows so that they can make their lives wretched and miserable. There's numerous cases where this seems to have been proven true. Whilst his wife was working at the cigarette factory WD&HO Wills on the Coast Road, Newcastle, back in the early 50s, 
Brian Simpson was meeting a woman in Jesmond nearby. And one afternoon they were having sex when suddenly the sheet was ripped from their bed. And there, standing above them, was a huge female figure who screamed so loudly that the neighbours called the police. As he grabbed his clothes, Simpson stepped out of bed, stood on one of his boots, turning his ankle and sending him crashing through the front window. His throat was cut and he bled to death in moments. During another illicit meeting at the Swallow Hotel in Gateshead in 1972, married Vivian Craig was in bed with married Dennis Purdy when something happened that made the local press. A photographer was working on a wedding in the functions room when he spotted a huge dark moving shape and photographed it. It disappeared and he thought nothing of it, continuing his wedding pics. Yet later that day an ambulance was called as a wardrobe had been thrown on top of the two lovers, breaking both of his legs and smashing into the woman's face, breaking her nose and snapping eight teeth off at the root. As the police had to be called, the affair was found out and both parties divorced. And afterwards Vivian said... The door opened and this huge black figure seemed to float in. We both just turned and stared as we could clearly see it. And just then, this huge wardrobe, far too heavy for any one man to move, flew eight feet through the air, hitting and hurting us both badly. This thing threw it like it was a child's toy. It was a ghost. I've no idea why. And in the Seaburn Hotel, further south, Joanne Clark was meeting James Burton during the seventh month of their affair. They decided to go down under the sands later that August night to have sex. And as they began undressing themselves, hidden from prying eyes, suddenly there was a woman standing between them. She had wide, staring eyes and with one flick of her arm had scratched claws into his flesh, dragging it down to his penis, scratching the flesh off that too. The woman screamed and despite only being partially dressed, ran off the sand straight in front of a van. She was hit, broke a collarbone and eight ribs. A spiritualist from South Shields in 1985 said at the open circle, cheating is the root of many hauntings. If you're there, even with your wife or girlfriend, spirits can feel the negative energy and seek to destroy it. They often choose to inhabit their house where this hypocrisy goes on, often making their presence known until the affair is ended. Footsteps across ceilings or attic floors, dark shapes in bedrooms while you try to sleep, and the sudden shock, all trying to let the cheat know that they're being watched from the other side. Kath Graham from Newcastle had been cheating and one day she walked into her house late at night, didn't bother turning on a light. Her dog suddenly started barking as if there was someone there. Just as she opened the door into her darkened bedroom, she was hit as if by a kick in the stomach and there was a huge sound of air blowing all around her. Yet the worst was when a young girl called Julie Haynes committed suicide after finding her fiancé, Paul Fairley, had been cheating on her. Fairley even took his new girlfriend, Helen Monk, to her funeral. Then on moving back into her home, the home he'd shared with Julie, everything began to happen. One night, Helen woke up the entire street screaming because someone with long fingernails was trying to kill her. Her neck had huge black bruises where she was being strangled and the following night, a small, fast-moving black shadow threw an iron at Paul as he sat watching television, causing him to require 17 stitches to his brow. Over 40 incidents in a matter of months and they both were petrified as to where it was leading. And then one night, there were a few bangs and bumps from the house and Helen said, let's get married. From the second she said that, the house began to stink. The pressure in the home gave them both severe headaches as they tried to shake it off. It arrived. It was obvious there was something in the room. Paul turned around screaming until he turned around to see his ex hanging from a noose in front of him. And yet she was staring right at him and said, 
Hello, Paul. In a half-choked voice, he moved towards her only to be knocked to his feet. Helen saw the image too and left him there and then, never to return. And if you betray someone, it may well be that your karma turns on you. Those who have felt that pain from the other side may decide to teach you a lesson. Have you been a good boy? Have you been a good girl? <laughs>